Well then, I've had a really good day today with the discrete components on the B build, and I think I've got more or less everything in now. Around here, there's a handful of resistors that I need to put in. Um, it's just 82 ohms, and I don't have that value to stock. All the capacitors are in. Now, some of the capacitors, like this electrolytic here, they're supposed to be auxil-based um, capacitors where the wires come out of each end. I don't have any of those, but I've got tons of normal capacitors, so I've just been using them. Now, somebody did mention in the comments that why have I not put the lowest form components in first and then built up? Well, that's what you'd normally do. However, because a lot of the components are quite high up, like the capacitors, and nearly all the resistors, or a fair number of them, are mounted vertically, I wanted to always have the sockets in and here in first so that when I flip the board over, the capacitors or any other components aren't actually touching anything so that they don't get bent or knocked. And that's the main reason, really. Right, so the next thing I'm going to do, which I will do tomorrow, is I've got to put in all the other IC sockets, of which there's not that many to do now. And I'm just going to put in whatever I've got and anything else I don't have I will put in. And I will then also put in all the inline connectors and all the jumper sockets and once all of that's in I can start popping in ICs and then hopefully we might be in a position where we can think about giving this machine a test. However I'm still waiting for some resistors and there might be the odd component I've missed but I've been pretty thorough going through it and I can't see any empty holes anywhere. Oh, and all the diodes are in as well. Now, I did put in some signal diodes that weren't needed according to the bill of materials. And also, there's a couple of capacitors that are listed on here, but they're not listed on the bill of materials. Now, one I have popped in, I think that was C45, but there's a couple of others as well. So I'm actually going to contact the guy who built the board just to see if I do need those capacitors or not. There's a few other bits and bobs we need, like here we've got a couple of trimmer pots. Now, one of the trimmer pots is for the pitch for the speech synthesizer that goes in here. So I'm not overly fussed about getting that in if I don't need to. And the other is the volume pot here, which you can just see if I move up there. And that's the volume level for the loudspeaker. So I definitely need to put that one in. I'm going to see if I've got any of those. But again, if I haven't, I'll just order up the correct value. Or I might just put something in that's close enough because it's only a volume control after all. It's the next day, and while I said that I've now finished for the day, I actually did carry on a little bit. And what I've done is I've put in the two trimmer pots. Now, this one here for the speech synthesizer, I desoldered that out of my original board because I didn't have a 200k pot. This one, the 10k trimmer, I had one of these, so I just popped it in. Now, I've added these two chips here. Now these have come out of my original beeb because I didn't have them. This is the sound generator and this is the amplifier for the speaker. Now I'm 99.9% .9 sure that in my old machine, the one that died, um, these chips worked because it made a constant beep. So it needs to make a constant beep, you need a sound generator, you need an amplifier, so they're okay. Um, this chip here, uh, I'm not sure what chip that does, something to do with sound or IO. Um, that's the first chip that I popped in from my stock of chips. And also this connector here, I actually had one of these. These, these are identical to the one that was in the Beeb. Again, I think this probably came from that collection of bits that I bought years ago. And uh, so that's where I am today. So the next job is that I'm going to put in all the IC sockets that I haven't done. And I'm going to put in all the jumper connectors, the little, the little dip things that go here that just slot the little cover on the top. And this is where... My original board's going to come in handy because I can use it as a reference point so I know which ones I need to solder in and also what position the jumpers are actually going on. Here we go then. As you can probably tell, there's a lot more sockets in the board. And yes, they don't match because I've got lots of different brands of uh, IC holders. But, you know, a project like this is really good to use them all up because otherwise they're just going to sit in a box forever. Now, where you can see there's spaces, that size of uh, IC holder, which I think is something 20 pin or thereabouts, um, I've run out of those, so I need to order some up. And then once I've got them, I can uh, finish populating the board. But other than that size, all the other IC holders are in, all the discrete components are in, apart from the res three resistors that go there that I'm waiting for them to arrive in the post. 
So I will now think about putting in all the dip connectors, the keyboard connector, and once they're all in, I will then start popping in ICs and then working out which ICs I have and which ICs I don't have. And even though all of the Econet stuff is soldered in, I'm not actually gonna put in an Econet ROM or anything yet. I'm just gonna keep this computer as stock just to make sure it all works first. And I'm not entirely sure if I'm ever likely to use Econet either. I just want it to be in there just so it's there. Today then, I've had a packet of resistors turn up so I can pop the three resistors in there that I need to do. Don't have the uh, dill sockets yet but I have got my uh, various bits of this stuff for putting in all the, uh, the various switches. I've got doubles and I've got singles so I'm going to start popping all those into the board now. That little bit's all done then and as you can maybe see on some of these here, maybe if I get a bit closer on there, and if you look here, for example, you can see I've got the jumpers already in place. And that's because, as I mentioned previously, I have my original board here and I just basically copied what was already there. So what was there has just been replicated on the reproduction board. Now, the only other thing I've done here is that there was a couple of re diodes that shouldn't have been there. There was about five diodes. Um, there were three down here. There was uh, one here I think and there was a couple down here and the bill material said they weren't actually required and I kind of thought well will it make any difference and I thought well maybe it will because obviously a diode is like a switch so it might be doing things that will make it not work so I've just taken those out and uh, so that's where we are at the moment hopefully tomorrow the IC holders here will arrive um, that's something we don't really need, but I might see if I can find a socket knocking around just to go in there just to uh, make it complete. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start looking around for ICs out of my boxes, and then I'll start populating the board with the various chips. It's a bright summer's day, and it is quite a long time since I've done any work at all on the BBC build. Now, here is my machine, and it has quite a few chips populated, and it looks nice inside its case. And I also happen to have here a disk interface system, which I have no reason to believe doesn't work, and that will eventually go inside. Now, the thing is this, I've actually been really nervous about finishing this off because I'm dreading it not working. And I probably shouldn't have put in as many chips as I already have. I should have just put in the absolute bare minimum needed to run a BBC Micro. Anyway, in here, I have a load of ICs. And this is the last bits that I needed, which I bought from Mauser and they're all here. Now, some chips I've already put in, but I wasn't 100% sure everything was completely compatible. I'm pretty sure they were, because they all came from the collection of ICs that the guy I bought a BBC off years ago, well, that's a couple of years ago now, had had as his spares. So there's no reason to believe what he had bought wasn't completely compatible. So I'm gonna go through each packet of ICs and put in what I need and I'm going to use the 8BS website that's got a really neat mapped picture of a Model B board and you can just click any place where there's a chip and it'll tell you what the chip is and vice versa so I can easily identify where all the chips are where they've got to go in and I will finish populating this board then I will think long and hard, look over everything, and then I'm going to test the power supply just one more time, plug it in, and see if we get those two beep tones that we wish to hear, or whether it's been a disaster. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna get on with popping in chips. Well, what do you know? I've got all the chips in that I bought, 
but there's still a few gaps, noticeably here, here, a couple up there. Uh, basically, I hadn't ordered all the chips I needed. I've got most of them, but there's still a few missing. So uh, another order of ICs, and then we can test. Well, one of the reasons that I didn't have all the chips is these six here, which are some kind of uh, octal buffer thing, I think. Uh, something like that. Anyway, they, um, they've ended up costing me six pounds each to get equivalents to go in there. So that's really bumped up the price. I think I've probably spent now getting on 150 pounds on components to build this. And this is definitely what you call a labor of love. It's not a project to take on because you think you can put together a cheap BBC Micro. This is probably the most expensive way of getting a BBC Micro. But you know what? That's not why we do it. Okay, it is getting to that time. Now, power supply is switched on. And you can see on there, I'm getting my five volts, that's good. I'm gonna just check the other voltage rail, which is on this wire. And this should be minus five volts. And it's minus 4.495. So I know the power supply is working. So I'm gonna switch it off now. Disconnect these wires. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna plug the power supply in. And then I'm gonna see if this thing works. Okay, I must say, I'm really nervous. Now, all the jumpers, as far as I can tell, are there set to how my old bead was. Some of them might be wrong, I don't know. There is an ice, one IC that isn't there, that I haven't got, but it was never in my original. And two ICs are missing here, but they're all to do with the RS-432 serial I.O. So that shouldn't matter. Okay, here we go. And it's not booting. Okay. Just check the keyboard is actually plugged in properly and that I got it on its right connection here. Yep, yeah, that looks okay. We'll push all the dip switches up and down. I'll give it one more go. Well, as you can see, it's not working, but it is kind of with that tricky test drum in. So it's doing something. We are getting video coming out of it, albeit not that great. Um, and I would say that the keyboard is probably okay. Um, because if I, well, certainly the brake key's working, but uh, the LEDs are flashing, you see. So something, that's good. So I'm just gonna turn this off now and I'm gonna try my other test drum, see what happens there. Okay, I've got this other test drum in now, and this is what happens. When I power on with the tricky test drum in the OS slot. If I hit brake. And seeing these dots and things, we are getting a cursor up there, which is something. Um, I'm kind of thinking we must have a RAM issue of some description or RAM addressing or something like that. So uh, back to the drawing board really, but at least we know things like the main system clock is working and the resets working. And uh, so I kind of think most of the stuff that I've soldered in is probably okay but otherwise it's, uh, well, it's not working. <laughs> oh my God, it's looking weird, but look. 
BBC Computer 32K language. I haven't got the basic ROM in yet, but there is a sign. Right then, the basic ROM is in. Let's see what happens. Oh my God. Oh my God. The screen's looking weird, but it's booted into basic. So yeah. Not all the keys are working, but that could just be a dirty key. Yeah, it's getting there, it's getting there. Okay, I think I had a RAM chip upside down. And uh, yeah, all I can say is this. Woohoo! It's working, it's got a couple of issues with the video. Uh, might just be my cable actually. Um, not all the keys are working but that'll be easy to sort out. But, yeah, I have built a BBC Micro and in essence, it looks like it's working. Oh my God, amazing. <laughs> the first thing I need to sort out is the keyboard. Now I put a new keyboard, or rather a keyboard at my old machine into this one and it, everything works perfectly. So I know there's nothing wrong with the actual computer. And what I did was I wrote down a list of all the keys that don't work. This then is the circuit diagram for the keyboard. And if we look closely, this is the matrix of the keyboard. Now, the keys that weren't working were one, two, six, R, U, etc., And one, two, six, R, U, O, P, and these two characters here, the up key and the, um, the brackets. And so we know the problem has something to do with how they're being fed. And it's this data line here, which is data line four. Although I did mark three for some reason. So what I need to do is I need to follow that on the circuit board. And if there's a problem with data line four, like there's a short circuit or something, then I can easily resolder it. Or it's gonna be a problem with this chip that it's connected to. Either way, it's gonna be one or the other. I've just brought the keyboard back in from the workshop and I think I found the problem. Basically what had happened was there had been um, some faulty keys on this keyboard, broken keys, and I'd replaced them. However, when I replaced this key here, I'd actually broken some of the track. So what I'd done is I'd wrapped a resistor leg around the peg, scraped off some of the green um, protective layer off the trace, and I've used a little bit of wire and soldered directly to the trace by being wrapped around the switch as well. So it does continuity test correctly now. So I'm gonna plug the keyboard in and we'll see if it works. When I switch on, you may notice something a bit weird on the screen, but it's not a problem at all. Switch on then and see what happens. And we're on. And there we go. And is our up key going? Down, left, right. Yep, that's working. Yep, we've got everything. Everything's working now on the keyboard. Now, if you're wondering why the text is in purple, it's because I've got a homemade um, a video cable, um, RGB cable, and one of the wires has just snapped off on the connector. Sometimes if I wiggle it, it goes back to how it should be. But we do have now a working keyboard. Right, I got everything working, including Turbo MMC, uh, Everything seems to work apart from this. In the basic startup mode, everything's fine. But if I go to any other mode, say mode three, type it in properly, but we just get this, we get this sort of horrible, sort of yucky colour. Oh, that's a point. It's a new morning and look out there, there's sunshine and look here there's a perfectly happy BBC Micro. 
And if I go to say mode two, everything is fine. Everything is hunky dory. Okay, let's press shift break. I think it is, there we go. And look, everything's loading up as it should do now. And if I scroll across, my favorite game and hit the space bar and as you can see everything's running now what the problem was is the ula that this computer has um it needs a modification and i can actually show you what that modification is now this was the donor board that i used for this computer that i got some of the chips off in fact i still need to desolder a couple there's uh, these two chips here for the serial data I haven't got those on my machine, so I'm gonna unplug that one and pop that one in and I'm gonna resolder that. But the ULA had a, a fault, a bug, which is this inversion thing. And what you have to do is you have to take out the associated jumper, which this one you can see there is no jumper on there, and you have to solder in a wire to join this to one of these chips here. And if I flip the board over, you can see quite clearly here that that mod has actually been done. And of course, obviously I wouldn't really have looked at that because I've never really looked at the underside of this board. But uh, anyway, now that mod has been done, I think, fingers crossed, the Beeb is now working exactly as it should be. Very important, the, the video ULA fit a heat sink to it. Now, I know the latter beeps, like the Issue 7s, where this one came from, didn't have a heat sink, whereas my Issue 4 one does have a heat sink, but it still gets warm. And if you want to preserve the longevity of your BBC Micro, always fit a heat sink because, you know, it, these things cost pennies and it could just save your chip because if that chip packs in, it's game over for the BBC. Well, I had a packet of screws turn up, so I was able to screw the main board in, although the one that goes in here has been slightly fouled by the IDC box. And that's completely my own fault. I should have noticed that when I soldered it in. So what I'm probably gonna have to do is just get a smaller screw or just not bother at all. Either way, it's not a massive issue. I just put these two chips in. These are to do with the RS-432, the serial data. They were both at my old machine. That one was socketed and that one was soldered in, but they're now in this machine. Even though it's not really necessary, I have heat, put a heat sink on the ULA, only because it did feel like it was getting warm earlier, and I thought, well, it's not going to do any harm. And apparently you don't actually need that resistor in there either. That's just for the Ferrant ULA, but... They were in my old ones, so I kind of thought, well, I might as well pop them in. There's also a space here on this ROM board because I need to have one ROM clear for the disk controller chip. Although I'm probably going to get another one of Steve Picton's ROM RAM board things. And so that I can just copy it across in software. But uh, I haven't got one yet. As you can remember, they sort of slot in here between the um, that ROM, I think, and the... CPU and they, they do a fantastic job. Now over here I haven't put the speech synth in yet and I probably won't bother at the moment uh, and I'm going to get myself an 8271 disc controller chip there because they're saying I've got all the other chips in and then that'll just make it all work. And as for the Ethernet area well it's Ethernet ready but I'm not in any rush to start messing around with stuff like that so I'm going to leave all of that exactly as it is. And I will probably eventually stick in an, a um, BNC connector for the composite video out. I just haven't bothered at the moment because I'm just going to be using the RGB output. I've got one more little test I want to do, and that is I want to check that the one megahertz bus works. And to do this, I'm going to, can, is it shift break? Yeah, shift break. I'm going to load up the Music 5000 software, and I've got the Music 5000 plugged in. And I've got a test, like a kind of a test program, really. Uh, I don't want to do that, do I? I want to load first. Uh, it's been so long since I've used this, so it was called Crimson. Um, anyone that knows me knows what that tune is. And we go into Notepad. And then if I go Crimson, which is the word, get, 
There we go. And if I turn this up a bit, hopefully when I hit F1, it should play a tune. So yeah, it's playing a tune. So the Music 5000 is working with this BBC Micro. So as much as I can test, everything appears to be working. Uh, the only thing I haven't done is the disk drive because the disk interface I've got kind of needs a little bit of a tweak. And I've actually just ordered the, the, the ordinary one. And uh, anyway, I've got the computer in the case now. And even though this is a little bit ugly here where this bit's broken, once I've got the ashtray cover in there, it'll look a bit neater. But I'm going to try and work out a way of covering this area over. Um, but what I'm really pleased about is the plastic strip along here because it did have several really deep scratches. And by using the magic that is Brasso, if I pan across, you can see it looks almost as good as new. So I'm really pleased with that. Well, I've wanted to have this video finished by now and it was finished, but then some upgrades turned up quicker than I thought. So we're gonna get this kind of finished, finished, finished now. I keep saying that, but uh, it's true. So I'm gonna switch the machine off to start with. And the first thing I want to install is what's in here and what's in here is the disk drive controller the 8271 chip so uh, i'm going to put it out of its bag and i ordered this yesterday from uh, mark from retro clinic and uh, it arrived this morning so uh, really great service as always from from mark and uh, yeah let's pop this in so that goes in like this and uh, yeah it fits in all right so that's all in place now, which is uh, good. I've also pulled out the chip that had the Turbo MMC program on it because I don't want to use that at the moment. I just want to check the Gotex working. And I've moved my ample ROM along to this end because this is lowest priority, this is highest priority. So basics on the end here. And I'll put our disk filing system ROM in there, which I don't have at the moment, but I will have one very, very soon. First thing we need then is our disk filing system and DFS 1.2 is right here. So we go save link as and keep that in my downloads. So we've got a disk filing system. Now we need to stick it onto a ROM. Now I have my little uh, trusty little uh, ROM programmer here and I've got an old ROM here. And this is actually a 27C128, which are very compatible, I think a 16K and they're perfectly good for the, uh, the BBCB. However, it wouldn't program to start with, and the reason being is you need to uncheck where it says check ID. You also need to uncheck pin detect, skip blank and blank check. Why? I don't know, but I find if you unclick those, then it will write the ROM chip. The ROM chip's now in the beep. I've got my GoTech plugged in, so let's switch on the computer. And we've got Acorn DFS, so if I now do a catalogue, and we're seeing what's on the disc, which in this case is nothing, because I think it's on a blank disc. Um, let's go on here and see what we got here. Nothing on there either, so it's, it's not quite seeing what we should be seeing. So uh, I need uh, another little, uh, little look at how this is set up. This will be why then, right there, there is a load of jumpers that I haven't soldered to the board, so uh, I better solder them in. Holy moly, I had a bit of a uh, panic then as I was getting the beep of death and uh, I just started reseating everything and it was one of these round chips here. Now, it's possible that I might need to just check the soldering and there might be a cold solder joint, but at the moment, it's okay. So actually those jumpers that I added, I added two more jumpers. Um, they were switch 18, switch 19, because that's what I read on the website. I said, yeah, let's change those, put those in, and I did. Turns out I didn't need them, so they're in there with nothing connected. But switch nine, which is over here, 
I had to disconnect and I hadn't disconnected it. And that's why probably the 1170 one that I had as well, that's probably why that didn't work anyway. Anyhow, let's do a star dot. There we go. There we go. The, um, that's working. Let's just see if we can get it to boot. Yeah, there we go. All working. Right, so now we have a fully working disc system and we have the Music 5000 working. So this is now, as far as I'm concerned, complete. It is working. It's all good. So I'm now going to put it all back together. <laughs> I now have a full set of ROMs because I've got my basic there, I've got the disk filing system, I've got WordWise Plus, I've got Ample and I've got the OS. Now I haven't put back the Turbo MMC card because the chances are I'm probably just going to get myself another GoTech to go with this because it is much easier to use a USB stick and it also means I can use the keyboard input for the Music 5000 because it's not using up the user port. Anyway, let's get this thing back together. Here's our little BBC Micro then and uh, I've just got one last upgrade for it I suppose and uh, that's this. This is the uh, ashtray cover to go here. And uh, I bought this from someone from eBay. It cost me £3.99, including delivery, which I thought was a reasonable price. And it should just slot in there to cover that hole. And it's not quite going in. Let's have a little... Oh, I see. Oh, hang on. There's a, it's come off the top here. It should just sort of slip in here between the, the speaker and the, the cover. So let's push that in. Let's, I don't want to break this, because uh, when you just bought it, but yeah, there we go. Okay, so that's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but, you know, if nothing else, it will just stop the dust getting in, or some dust getting in. Um, but in an ideal world, I want to get this kind of replaced at some point. But, you know, it's got war wounds, but this is it. It's finished. It's now got our... GoTech drive that will now work with this. I'll just go and pick something at random like, ah. Oh. Nice gear star dot. And uh, yes, yeah, see if this boots. There we go. Loading up my all time favorite computer game, Chucky Egg. It's uh, most satisfying just watching this load. Now, believe it or not, this is, I think, the fifth ending I've made for this video because every time I kind of finish the video, then I'll do something else, then I'll do something else, and, uh, oh, I'm just going to do this to it, I'm just going to do that to it, and blah, 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 blah. Anyway, the, the kind of reason why that I decided to, um, to just leave it to the end here now is because I just wanted to check that the the floppy disk controller did indeed work because that, that's the one thing I hadn't got to work and you know it's all a learning curve you know you learn something every day and today I learned about how more about how the disk controller works and I read more about it and actually when it said you had to break a track actually it was a it was a jumper and it was a jumper I'd already put in and I had to do literally just pull a pin out rather than take it into the shed and solder some things in and then it stops working again because I've nudged a, a RAM chip. And it was actually the RAM chip that was sat here by the power connector. And I can actually see why when they made these new that they actually soldered the RAM in rather than socketing them because, you know, you only got to have one RAM chip slightly lose contact and the whole thing stops working. So, um, you know, what well, can I say? These things are delicate. Anyhow, I am now at the position where everything's working. I've tested everything. The only thing I have not tested is the tube port, but I've never used it. I've never, you know, I don't have a Raspberry Pi coprocessor, but if I did, I am confident, touching a bit of wood here, that it would work. Um, the only other thing I haven't tried, I suppose, is the serial data, you know, the modem connector, but Who's going to use that anyway? I mean, I have got the modem, obviously. I've done a video about it. And I'm sure if I popped it in, it probably would work. But uh, at the moment, 
All I really want to use it for is the everyday things that I would use a BBC Micro for, which is the Music 5000 system, anything else connected with music, doing your bit of programming and playing the odd round of Chucky Egg. Anyway, this really is it. This is the end of the journey now for building this computer. And I really want to thank Rob Taylor for spending probably years remaking and redesigning the circuit board for this computer because, you know, if he hadn't done it, we, this video wouldn't exist. And I don't know how many other people have built these computers. I've had a few comments on the other videos from people saying they've built them and they've been really happy. So, yeah, thank you to Rob for doing that. And also thank you to Mark Hazeman from Retro Clinic because he's advised me a couple of times on a few different things on here and also supplied me some of the parts that I needed. Um, from memory, uh, some of the chips I've bought from him, the disc controller, there's the, is it the 4545? Can't remember anyway. I bought that off him ages ago because I thought I needed that on another machine. And a few other bits and bobs that I got from him. And uh, between those two chaps and my bank balance, <laughs> we have this computer. Now, talking of the bank balance, it, it's not, been a cheap thing to do. I mean, there were those six chips there that go towards the RAM. I mean, they cost me 30 pounds just for those six chips. And the memory, I bought the RAM ages ago. Again, because this kind of started as a project for me to fix my old machine, which I never got around to doing. So I did buy the RAM then and a couple other bits. And so I, I couldn't tell you exactly how much this has cost me to build but not including a donor machine. And I really think you can't do this without a donor machine because you need all those custom chips and stuff. And also it's, it makes a nice template for as you're building, just to have a look and see how things are. Um, you're looking at least 200 pounds, maybe 250, depending on whether you find the bits from. So it's not a cheap thing, but when you think that this computer in 1983, when my parents bought me mine for Christmas, was £300, so that's already £150 more. I mean, why a donor machine? Well, you could probably find a dead bee for 50, 60 quid if you hunt around. So say it's a 300 quid project, that's already £100 less than what a new one cost in 1983. And if you allow for inflation, then you're looking that they would have been well over a grand. So. You know, the good forward investment on this is if you build it and you build it well, then it's going to be better, I would say. Some may argue, if you do, leave a comment. It'd be interesting to hear it. I would say if you were to build a new one and get it working perfectly, then that is probably going to last a lot longer than buying an old machine, even if you get it restored. Um, but of course, if you have got a donor machine, the other thing, of course, always, 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 always recap the power supply. And if you're not confident on doing that, get somebody who is, i.e. Retro Clinic or a few other people around as well. Even your local sort of TV repair shop, if you have, still have such a thing, they, they'll be skilled enough to uh, recap the power supply because that's, that's the other weak link. The power supply and the ULA are the two weakest links in this machine. Anyway, I shall shut up now <laughs> and uh, I'm going to go and edit this video now for you to all see. And there were, there's lots more stuff coming on the channel. I've got loads of things coming up. Um, I've I kind of half edited probably about eight videos of various ongoing electronics projects. I've also got a fun pop music video that will be coming out probably next week as well. Anyway. Thank you for watching. As ever, please like and subscribe, and I'll catch you on the next one.